Well, kids, now we come to the point in the sermon, in the, in the uh, service, when we do the sermon. And every single worship service, we have a time when somebody, one of the pastors or one of the teachers at Hillside, gives a sermon. And a sermon is when somebody reads a section of scripture and tells us all, explains to us what it means and how we can live in joyful response. That's what we're doing right now. We have somebody really special here to do that for us. This week, the original plan was for Stephen Weissong to preach, which is always just such a highlight. He unfortunately got sick at the end of the week, was unable to, uh, to do it. And before we could come up with an alternative plan, we got a call from a great friend of Hillside, Stephen's dad, Chuck Wysong, and said, hey, I know Stephen's sick. Can I be of some help to you this week? And I said, absolutely. We would be so delighted, and we'd wanted Chuck to be here anyway. Uh, So this is one of the mornings. Before he, I'll tell you who he is. Chuck is a covenant pastor. Uh, and he is the director of Mission Springs and gives leadership to Mission Springs. A plate, yeah. So it's just uh, it's wonderful to have you here. Uh, we have a scripture reading this morning. The original child reader got sick and was not able to be here this morning. So d- d- got that word just about 20 minutes ago, or a little longer than that, 45 minutes ago. So I frantically looked around to find a replacement, and I, I stalked Liliana Canfield, and I said, would you read for us? And she said, of course I will. So a cold reading. So anyway. Thank you. <laughs> Psalm 119, 81 through 88. My soul longs for your salvation. I hope in your word. My eyes long for your promise. I ask, when will you comfort me? For I have become like a wineskin in the smoke, yet I have not forgotten your statutes. How long must your servant endure? When will you judge those who persecute me? The insolent have dug pitfalls for me. They do not live according to your law. All your commandments are sure. They persecute me with falsehood. Help me. They have almost made an end of me on earth, but I have not forsaken your precepts. In your steadfast love, give me life that I may keep the testimonies of your mouth. All right, good morning, Hillside. Hey, I'm so delighted to be with all of you. Uh, uh, I I got the call from Stephen on Thursday that he said, Dad, I can't do it. And I said, well, what do you want me to do? (laughs) And uh, anyways, no, I am so delighted to be here. Thanks Thanks for the invite. I really appreciate that. Um, our favorite camp starting the summer is always Hillside Covenant Church. You in May when you come, you kind of launch us going forward into the summer. So we love having you at our, uh, at our camp at Mission Springs. And we are concluding next week is our last week of Frontier Ranch. If you can believe that, we've had hundreds and hundreds of decisions for Jesus Christ uh, among our campers. Can we give it up for God for that? It's been amazing. It's been a great summer. We had a kid, uh, a kid came to camp and the kid uh, said to the counselor, um, it, it's nice to feel human again going to camp because they haven't been out playing, being with friends and this and that. And it's so awesome to be able to do camp. God is alive and well at Mission Springs, but I think God is alive and well right here at Hillside Covenant Church. Would you agree with that? Um, if you have a woman doing the robot up here on stage. God has to be moving here at this church. It's amazing. I'm telling you, I, that was just incredible. But um, I, I also want to uh, give it up for your pastor and leaders. Can we thank God for them and all the great work they do? They're so awesome. Just three weeks ago, we had an inner city uh, church bring their youth uh, group to uh, Mission Springs. There's about close to 200 of them, Midtown Covenant Church. And uh, all of a sudden, I get word, people are texting and stuff, uh, that you got to get up to the pool. And there were over 50 baptisms of these inner city high school, junior high kids in the Mission Springs pool. It was just so amazing. Uh, I don't know if you know who Mike Holmgren is, and some of our leaders were around the pool. Everyone was crying watching this happen. So it's so amazing to see life change uh, happening over and over again at Mission Springs. It, well, I uh, grew up in Southern California. That's where I started. My mom and dad had three children, one of each kind. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I, 
I was the third. I was the baby of the family. Uh, I'm, my brother Mike, the middle brother, and Jim, the older brother, we grew up uh, really close to one another. But my brother Mike, the middle brother, he could get me to do anything. He could manipulate me into anything. Can I see, who are the older children in the family? Can I see the older kids? Okay, yeah. Who are the middle children? Can I see you? Yeah, you're the manipulators. You're the ones. I see you. And then who are the babies? The babies of the family? Yeah, this is my favorite right here. Okay. I'll never forget, it was, it was coming into the fall, and uh, last week of summer, and my dad had just put a peephole in our front door, and uh, there was a knock at the door, and my brother Mike and I go to the door, Jim was out shopping with my mom, and uh, we, my brother goes, looks through the peephole, and he goes, who is it? And she says, it's Julie Bither. And Mike goes, what do you want? And so you don't know this. I'm going to tell you who she is. She's Jim's girlfriend. And she was coming, little did we know, to show Jim her new fall clothes that she bought. And she was wearing so. So she's at the door. And Mike goes, one minute. And he turns to me. I'm a, I'm a seventh grader. Mike's in ninth grade. He goes, hey, Chuck, I've got a great idea. And I said, what? And he goes, he goes you go fill up a bucket of water and come back I'll count to three I'll open the door and you throw it on her and I went I went <laughs> okay <laughs> so I go and I, I fill up this bucket of water and I come back and Mike goes one two three and he opens the door and I throw this bucket of water on her and we slammed the door we were laughing we thought this is the funniest thing on the planet right 20 minutes later there is a knock on the door and Mike goes to the door and he looks through and he says, who is it? She goes, it's Julie Bither, you jerk, let me in. And Mike goes, one minute. And he turns to me and he says, hey, Chuck, I've got a great idea. I said, what? And he goes, let's fill up two buckets of water and we'll throw it on her. And I went, okay. You know, so we fill up two buckets of water. We come back. Mike says, one, two, three, opens the door. We throw the water on her and we were ready to shut the door. And somehow she threw her body in between the door being shut. She was now in our house. Mike ran this way, I ran this way, and she was on my tail. She was yelling and screaming and I'm yelling, Mike, where are you? Help me, Mike. And we go into uh, his bedroom, and Mike is sitting on his bed reading his Bible. <laughs> and he says, Chuck, what did you do now, right? <laughs> so Mike, he could get me to do anything. Well, our family, we're like a lot of you. We grew up going to church. And uh, I grew up going to Sunday school. I did these little singing things up here for vacation Bible school when I was a little guy. And uh, I grew up going to church, but my problem growing up going to church, I started to form three misunderstandings of who this God is. And here, I'd grown up going to Sunday school. I grew up hearing about God, hearing about Moses and David and all that. But I started to form these misunderstandings. Do you know what I mean by a misunderstanding? I heard this story of a woman. She was moving from England to India. And she was going to do schoolwork there. And, and uh, she rented a, a, an apartment. But she moved back home to get all of her stuff. And she forgot to ask the apartment manager if uh, he had a WC. Because she started to think, am I going to have to, you, do you all know what a WC is, by the way? What, what's a WC? A water closet or what? A bathroom, right? Do you have a bathroom? Do, am I going to have my own bathroom? Am I sharing with people? That's what she was asking, okay? So she sends this letter back to him. Do you have a WC? And um, he doesn't know what she's talking about. He totally misunderstands it. So she, she, he, he ends up going to his local pastor, and he says, what's a WC? I don't even know what that is. And he said, well, it, it must mean the wayside church. That must be what the WC is. And so with that, he writes this true letter back to this woman. She's thinking, do you have a WC, a bathroom? He's now writing, we have the wayside church. How would you receive this? Dear madam, I take great pleasure in informing you that the WC is located nine miles from the house. 
It's located in the middle of a grove of pine trees surrounded by lovely grounds. It's capable of holding 229 people and it's open on Sundays and Thursdays only. As there are many people expected in the summer months, I suggest you arrive early. <laughs> there is, however, plenty of standing room. <laughs> this is an unfortunate situation, especially if you're in the habit of going regularly. It may be of some interest to you that my daughter was married in the WC <laughs> since she met her husband there as well. It was a wonderful event. There were 10 people to every seat. It was wonderful to see the expression on their faces. My wife sadly has been ill and unable to go recently. It has been almost a year since she went last, which pains her greatly. <laughs> you will be pleased to know that many people bring their lunch and make a day of it. Others prefer to wait till the last minute and arrive just on time. I would recommend that your ladyship plan to go on Thursdays as there's an organ accompaniment. The acoustics are excellent and even the most delicate sounds can be heard everywhere. The newest addition is a bell which rings every time a person enters. We are holding a bazaar to provide plush seats for all since many fill us long needed and I look forward to escorting you there myself and seating you in a place where you can be seen by all. Sincerely, the apartment manager. Now, would you say that is a misunderstanding, right? I had a huge misunderstanding when it came to God. Some of you are going, he just did potty humor in the church. I can't even believe that. But I had, I had three misunderstandings when it came to this great God and understanding him. And the first is I thought I knew everything there was to know about God. But my problem was, I didn't know God. Can you know someone and not know them? One of the fun things that I've gotten to do as a pastor and as a speaker is I've gotten uh, to do NFL chapels and M NBA chapels. And one of my favorite ones, this is a long time ago, my first one actually, was the Denver Broncos. And I was very excited about doing the NFL chapel for the Broncos because my favorite coach, he actually just passed away a couple years ago, Dan Reeves was the head coach of, of the Denver Broncos. And I was really excited that, that he was going to be there. And, and so I was sitting in the front, this guy Carl Mecklenburg, this gigantic linebacker, he was going to be introducing me and stuff like that. And the, the, the play was packed because it was it was in the preseason so everybody was there they're all praying that they're going to make the team so the whole the whole team's in there and I was in the front and and I'm excited to give the message and and Carl Mecklenburg uh, he introduces me and I stand up and I turn around and literally seated right there in like the second row was Dan Reeves okay I knew about Dan Reeves. I knew where he lived. We, we lived in Denver uh, at the time, and he lived out in Cherry uh, Hills, out in that area. I knew where he lived. I knew all the stats about Dan Reeves. But when I stood up and saw Dan Reeves, I didn't know him. I didn't have a personal relationship with him, and my mouth went completely dry. I couldn't say anything for 30 seconds. I was going <laughs> like that. And even the linebackers were saying, he was, he's as dumb as we are, you know. So, and, and finally I got the words out and I did the chapel that day. But I want you to hear this. I knew about Dan Reeves, but I didn't have a personal relationship with him. I didn't have a friendship with him. That's how I was with God. My relationship with God was, I knew about Moses, I knew about David, I even knew about Jesus Christ, but I didn't know God in a personal way. I was really having more of a religion with God. I didn't have a relationship with God. It was my junior year in high school. I'll never forget. I was walking across my campus and this, this huge kind of question came down onto me because I was feeling very lonely at the time. And, and right now in our society, 
We have a very lonely, lonely society. People have been isolated. I think one of the greatest organizations on the planet is the church. I really do. Because we can provide what people are desperately looking for. They're looking for family and friends. And I was walking across the campus and I started to think this question. If I disappeared, would anybody give a rip that I was on this planet? Would anybody give me give a rip? And I remember, I, I remember saying this, God, and I hadn't talked to him. I, I only knew about him and this, that, but I said, God, if you're real, I want to give you a shot. I want to give you a shot. And I remember going home that night saying, I'm going to read my Bible, not to put me to sleep at night, but I'm, every night before I go to bed, I want to read the Bible. And I started to read the Bible, and believe it or not, in Psalms 119 that was just read, verse 81, I can totally relate to King David because he says, he says, God, I am worn out waiting for your rescue, but I have put my hope in your word. My eyes are straining to see your promises come true. When will you comfort me? Friends, I had nowhere else to turn at that moment. No one was able to comfort me at that point. I was looking for God, and God found me that night. And I'll never forget, I I kept reading in the Bible, and I came across Romans chapter 5, verse 8. And this is probably one of the greatest verses for me. And it says this, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I had a lot of people in my life, they were saying they loved me. My dad at the time, he said he loved me, but he wasn't demonstrating his love. I had lots of friends in my life. They were saying that they were my friends, but they weren't demonstrating that they were my friends. Actually, they a lot, I had a lot of friends tucking behind my back, and it was really hurtful for me. I felt very lonely. And at that Romans chapter 5, God demonstrated his love. He didn't just say it. He proved it. And how did he do that? It says he, his own love for us in that while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. Here's what I got out of that. I did the sinning. Jesus did the dying. He didn't have to die on the cross. I did the sinning. He did the dying. And that night, I went from knowing about God to knowing him in a personal way. And it changed my life. It changed my life. But there was a second misunderstanding that I had. And that second was, I can know God. I didn't know this God knew me. With 7.8 billion people on the planet, how could God know me? And even if he did, what difference would it make in my life? I heard a story of a, a football player. Actually, he was called the laziest football player on the team. And uh, he showed up at practice. And when, the, when the, the, the team was doing their five laps, he would only do one. He would show up to practice late all the time. And actually, the coach was ready to cut this kid from the team. Well, one day at practice, there was a letter sent to the coach. And the coach got the letter, and it was was for this kid. His name was on on the letter. He said, hey, uh, I I just got this delivered. And the kid said, coach, you read it. You, You read it. So the coach opened it up, and it literally said this, son, come home. Your father has just died. Mom. And he looked at the coach, and the coach looked at him, and he said, can I be excused to go home? He says, yeah, you you can go. Take care of what you need to take care of. And the coach thought he would never see this kid again, but that Friday night was homecoming. And sure enough, he showed up. He was dressing up. And the coach was going, wow, I can't even believe he's here. They run onto the field, and as soon as the ball was kicked... In, in the first quarter, the kid ran up to the coach and said, Coach, please, you got to let me play tonight. You have to let me play tonight. And the coach says, you know, I'm going to go with guys that actually practice this week. Take a seat on the bench. And the kid sat on the bench. And then as the second quarter came, he ran up and says, Coach, please, you, you got to let me play tonight. He says, I, you know, take a seat on the bench. Well, it's halftime. Coach and the team are down 21-0. 
It comes to third quarter, and the kid's saying, Coach, you've got to let me play. And the coach says, well, he can't really hurt the team. Now, go in, go in on the kickoff. So he went on the kickoff, and he actually tackled the guy uh, uh, on the opposing team. So the coach said, I'm going to let him stay in. So he put him in. He was defensive in. This kid ignited the entire team. He was on fire. He's saying, you guys, we can do it. The coach liked what he saw so much, he put him on offense as well. And now he's on offense, and it's fourth quarter, and they're tied, and the quarterback goes back, he throws the ball right into this kid's arms, and he wins the game. Everyone's going crazy. The coach runs up to the kid. He pulls him off. He's on everyone's shoulders. He pulls him down, takes him under the, 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 the football stands, and says, what got into you? I've never seen you play like this before. What got into you? And the kid got real quiet, and he looked at the coach, and he said, Coach, you know my dad died this week, right? He said, yeah. He goes, what does that have to do anything? He said, Coach, my dad, he was blind. He said, tonight was the first night that he ever saw me play. Does it matter that we have a God that can see us? that wants to be in a relationship with us. In Psalms uh, 139, one of my favorite Psalms of the entire Bible, it says this in verse 17, how precious are the thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. Your thoughts outnumber the grains of sand. When I wake up, you're still with me. Get this, friends. God thinks of you and me more than the sands of the sea every single day. I knew God now. I all of a sudden realized God knew me, but there was a third misunderstanding. It was this. I didn't know this God loved me. I really didn't know this God loved me. Um, I, and, and what I found out in Psalms 119.88, it's up on the screen. Not only does God love us, but look what it says. In your unfailing love, spare my life. Then I can continue to obey your laws. Our great God has an unfailing love. As a pastor, we planted a church one time down in Santa Barbara. Somebody had to reach those horrible people down there. We thought it may as well be us. So we're down there. We're planting the church. And after about 18 months, I was dry. I was, I was just really uh, burning out. And I remember walking by the ocean and looking out at the ocean. And I remember just saying, God, I had, the, I had a little coffee cup. I said, if you could only just fill up this cup uh, with, with some of more of your love and power in my life. I, I need you right now. And I remember the Lord just saying to me, why song, I can fill up your little cup, but I have a whole ocean of my love and power I'd like to pour into your life. What do you want? And I said, bring it on. Pour out your love into my life. And this great God, he doesn't just have a love for you. He has what I call a crazy love for you. I heard a story of a little girl. She really did not like to go to sleep at night. It was really difficult. I know any parent in here, I know you never have problems putting your kids down at night, but she just did not want to go to sleep. And so one night, finally, they got, got her to go to sleep and they went downstairs. They collapsed on the couch. And wouldn't you know it, a lightning and thunderstorm hit, okay? And it is rocking and rolling. If you ever lived in the Midwest or anywhere where there's these gigantic thunderstorms, and it was just shaking the house. It was so loud. Well, they thought, oh, man, we better check on our daughter. So they walk up the stairs. They're trying to be quiet. They don't want to wake her up. They open up the door, and right when they opened up the door, there was a flash of lightning, and they looked, and standing on the windowsill was their daughter. And right when the lightning flashed, she went like this, <laughs> looking out, looking out into the street. And the dad said, what are you doing? And she said, oh, look, mommy, look, daddy. God's taken flash pictures of me. <laughs> she had this, this whole feeling and thought, God was just all out crazy in love with her, taking flash pictures, showing the 
pictures to the angels and saying, look at my daughter. Look at how precious she is. Oh, I love her. Look at my son. He kind of looks like me. That's what our great God thinks when he thinks of you and me. He has an unfailing love. You know this verse. I'm going to read it to us. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We don't necessarily read this next verse. I love it because here's what it says. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. So those were my three misunderstandings. I thought I knew everything there was to know about God, but I had a problem. I didn't know God. I didn't know this God knew me. And last, I didn't know this God really loved me. And when I understood that, it changed my life. I'm going to close with this. A guy walked in to his pastor's office. And he said, Pastor, I finally have figured out what's wrong with my faith. And the pastor said, really, what, what's wrong with your faith? And he said, what I figured out is I just don't love God enough. If I just loved God a little bit more, my faith would, would, would be on fire. And the pastor looked at him and said, that's not your problem. He said, it's not, no, what's, what's my problem? He goes, your problem isn't that you don't love God enough. Listen to this. The pastor said, your problem is you don't know how much this God really loves you. If you really understood how much this God loved you, your faith in life would be changed. Would you bow your heads with me and let's pray. God, I thank you so much for this church. I just sense life in this church. I, I sense just a, a, a unified family in this church. It's so good to be here today. And I thank you, God, that, um, th that we were getting a chance to study Psalms 119. And Lord, thank you that that verse says you have an unfailing love. And friends, right now, where you're seated, I believe you were brought here today for a purpose to hear you matter to God. More than you ever know, you matter to God. You don't have to perform for God and do certain things for God. God loves you based on his character, not on your performance. And right now where you're seated today, Maybe this is your day that you're going to say, Lord, I don't want to just know about you. I want to know you in a personal way. Lord, thank you that you know me and, 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 and that you would even say here today, Lord, thank you for loving me as who I am. And right now, if that's you today, I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. But I would love to pray a prayer. If you would silently from your heart pray this prayer, I will pray this out loud. Follow me. And why not receive the love of Jesus in your heart today? Would you pray with me? Silently from your heart. I'm going to pray out loud. And you silently pray this prayer. Dear Jesus, pray this from your heart. I need you. And I ask that you would come into my heart. That, Lord, you would forgive me of my sin. You would clean me up from within. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. And thank you for rising from the dead for me. And thank you for giving me eternal life. You know, with every head bowed, and eyes closed. Again, I'm not going to call you out, but I would love to pray for you. If you just prayed that prayer, would you just simply right now, I'm not going to call you out, but if you would just simply raise your hand and say, I just prayed that prayer today. Would you raise your hand up real high? All around the room, real high. Oh man, that's awesome. That's so great. Anyone else? Raise it up real high. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you so much for the many in here that have said that they have invited this your love into their lives today. Thank you, God, that I hope that they would know they can move from just knowing about you, that they can know you. 
And one of the greatest things, Lord, is that they would be connected right here at Hillside Covenant, at this great church where they can hear great teaching and learn how to follow you. So bless them. May you fill them with your presence. And Lord, thank you for every child that, that got a chance to participate in Vacation Bible School this week. We pray that these little seeds would find roots in their little hearts and lives and that God, they would grow up as mighty oaks of faith following you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Hey, can we thank God for the many in this room that welcomed Christ in their lives today? Can we do that? That's awesome. All right. Hey, can we thank Dan, Pastor Dan? Good job, man. It was awesome. Good. Hey, uh, you. this is like the church that eats a lot, right? I mean, my gosh. Barbecue and stuff and eating pizza and all that. I'm actually going to make it over to Scipolini's today. I love Scipolini's. That place rocks. Is Terry Camp in the room? Are you somewhere? I know you can't raise your hand. Raise your other hand. There's your, there he is. Okay. You may know this. You may not know this. But um, thank you to him and his uh, business. What, what, Terry, Camp and Camp Associates. Is that what you say? Architectural firm. Um, they designed Mission Springs brand new memorial prayer garden okay and uh i don't think uh did you all get to see it at all i don't know if you saw that many of you but now there there's more things that are on it and we have pavers at memorial uh, pavers that are happening there and terry thank you so much you the excellence in your design and all that it it's one of those things at Mission Springs, when you give to Mission Springs, it's something that lasts like 50 years. So thank you so much for that. And, uh, but, but hey, thank you so much for allowing me to be here. I love your pastor and you all. And now let me give you the benediction. Now may the God of love, may he bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you, lift up his countenance upon you, and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said... Amen. God bless everybody. Have a great week.